So when you're preparing salts, there are two things that you need to remember. Number one, obviously the identity of the salt. So you need to figure out what salt do I need? So it, you will need to figure out what is your cation and what's your anion. So you need to figure that out. You need to know for about that. So for example, if you want to make sodium chloride, you are going to look for something that will give you sodium ion and something that will give you chloride ions. Uh, usually how that works is that we figure out that any other salt or sub metal, depending on the method that we choose and depending on the salt that we choose, can we get that and we can make the salt. Second thing you need to figure out is that once you've made the salt, how will you purify it? How will you extract it or separate it from the mixture that you have? Because obviously you are going to get a mixture of different products or if not products, then something in the reactants might be left over. The thing that is in excess. So you need to figure out a way before you start preparing the salt that how will you extract the salt? So for example, if you're getting soluble salts, then they will be dissolved in water in there. So you need to make sure that water evaporates and you're left with pure salt. Similarly, if you're working for insoluble salt, then they will not dissolve in water and they will be settling at the bottom. So you need to find a way to get that, uh, that precipitate out. Okay, so obviously that's going to be filtration. Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, you have to figure out whether the salt that you make is soluble or insoluble so that you can extract it. All right. So let's go over the reactions one more time to figure out that in what reaction the salt produced. Okay. So the first reaction that we talked about, it was that you take metal, you add it to acid and you will get salt and hydrogen. This is a displacement reaction. Why? Because the metal that you get, it's going to displace hydrogen and you're going to get salt. So the hydrogen ion, remember that every acid has hydrogen ions that it's going to give. So the hydrogen ion will give, uh, will be replaced by the uh, so metal that you have. So the metal that you have, it's, if it is more reactive, it's going to replace the hydrogen ion and give you the salt that you need. So that's the thing. If it is less reactive, then obviously this method won't work. So this method only works if metal is more reactive than hydrogen ion. So for that, you have to look in the reactivity series. Once you get that, your salt is going to be aqueous. So you need to figure out a way to extract that salt from the solution. Also, another thing that you need to make sure whenever you're taking this, whenever you're doing this reaction is that if your salt is aqueous, then acid or any other aqueous thing shouldn't be left over because otherwise it will be mixed. So here's how it goes. So we have, let's suppose this conical flask and it has acid in it and I add the metal in there. So the metal piece starts to resolve and I'm going to get some salt. Now at the end, if I still have some acid left over, then I will have salt as well as acid mixed together. So no matter what I do with it, I will find it really, really difficult to extract this acid from this mixture. So salt will always be impure in this case. So what do you need? You need to make sure that there is no acid left over. And for that, what you'll do is that you will make sure that your acid should be the limiting reactant and the solid part should be in excess. Why? Because solids are easily separable from the aqueous states. You take the solid, you filter it, solid upar rejega, acid will be brought to the bottom and that is how uh, salt will be brought to the bottom and that is how you will get whatever you're looking for. Okay? So you need to make sure that the metal you have, it is in excess, it is left over. You can then simply filter this. So if you filter this, then what will you get? So you have a filter. So in that filter, you're going to get the metal pieces over here. So this is a filter paper. The metal pieces are going to be left over. Yeah, if this was the beaker, then I will get salt in the aqua state at the bottom. What happened to acid? Acid was limiting reactant. So it was completely used up. So this is your metal. 
that was unreacted, that was left over, and you're able to get salt. Now, if you did not have metal in excess, this would have been a disaster as far as extracting salt is concerned. So there's always the preparation part and there's the extraction part. So those things go hand in hand. Okay, let's try to see the second method. The second method that we talked about was neutralization. Okay, so neutralization, how does that work? So you take acid and alkali, and the problem with this reaction is that they're both aqueous. So this is soluble in water. This is also soluble in water. So when they react, sure, they produce salt and water and salt in this case is also soluble. Now here's the problem. If I have acid in excess, then at the end, I will have some acid and salt with water. They're both aqueous, so I can't separate salt and acid. If I have alkali in excess, then alkali and salt will both be aqueous. They will both be dissolved in water and very difficult to extract. So this reaction, I cannot do it in the usual way. I cannot have acid or alkali, either of them in excess. Mujhe wo dono ko itni amount mein add karna hai ki mera salt bane kuch aur bane hi na. Or kuch rahe bhi na. I need to make sure that all the acid and all the alkali that I have, both of them are just come enough to react. So that's what I do. And how do you do that? Because it's aqua salt, it's soluble salt. One way of doing this reaction is that you first do it with the indicator and then you do it without the indicator. And that method is called titration. So how does titration work? So let's suppose you start with alkali. So you have alkali here and you know how much alkali you have, 20 cm cube, 25 cm cube, whatever. And then you add, use a burette, burette has a tap. You use a burette to make sure that you add enough acid that the indicator that you have, it changes its color. Yeah, so we take the acid in the burette and we're going to put it in the alkali drop by drop. So obviously there'd come a time when the indicator will change color and that is when you stop. You read how much acid you added. Why is that important? Because that is the amount of acid, the amount of acid that you need to fully neutralize it, to fully react the alkali that you have. So now you know how much alkali you need and how much acid you need. So now you're going to repeat this process, but this time you're not going to use an indicator. So you take the same steps and you repeat this, but this time without indicator. And you make sure that the amount that you had previously you add that much. What will that do? So now at the end, all the alkali will be used up and you will be left with just salt in aqua state. So now you can simply crystallize. Crystallization means that you heat it to saturation point and then you slowly cool so that crystals get the time they need to bond together. Okay. So that's the thing you Type, do this reaction if you have both the reactants that are aqueous and your salt is also aqueous. So one more time, you take the acid and the alkali and you need them in just enough quantity. So what you do is you take the acid, put it in the alkali with the indicator there. Once the indicator changes color, you know how much acid you needed to make. Then you simply repeat the process with the same amounts of acid and alkali. And this time you don't have to add indicator because you know the amounts. And then you simply uh, repeat the process without the indicator, you get the salt, you crystallize the salt. Okay. If you need to write it in detail, then crystallization involves, you first heat it to saturation point, then you slowly cool so crystals are made. The third method that we had was that you took a base, which was not alkali and you add it to acid and you would get salt, water. And if you have carbonate, then 
carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide doesn't come every time. Only if there is carbonate present, only then will you get carbon dioxide. So here's the thing. This is going to be solid. This is going to be aqueous. This is going to be aqueous and this is going to be liquid. So what this means is that the solid part can be separated from the aqueous salt because salt is soluble. You can easily filter it out. So that is why we need this in excess. So we make sure that the base that you have, which is the solid in this case, you take that in excess. When both of them were aqueous, we did not take any of them in excess. We tried to get just enough quantity. In this case, we wanted to get the salt out. So we made sure that solid part was in excess. So this method is also no different from that one. You take the solid base as something in excess and acid in limited quantity. Now, because it's a solid, it's always a good idea to heat it so that it reacts. It has enough kinetic energy to simply move around or dissolve faster with the acid and react faster. So that helps. Also, if carbon dioxide is there, then you can simply see the bubbles coming out and you will know when the reaction is complete, how the bubbles will stop coming. Okay. So that's how it goes. So for example, if I wanted to make copper sulfate using this method, I can't use this method for that because copper is less reactive than hydrogen. But if I add copper sulfate, then I can simply take copper oxide, which is base and maybe react it with sulfuric acid. Why am I choosing these things? Because copper oxide will give me copper and sulfuric acid will give me sulfate. Okay. So I need copper sulfate. So I will get copper sulfate with water. Now this is solid. This is aqueous. This is also aqueous. This is liquid. So I will heat the reaction a little bit reaction vessel that I have. And that is how I will be able to get it. Okay. Similarly, I could have used copper carbonate for the same reaction. So if I had copper carbonate and I reacted with the stress of four, this will be slightly different from that because I will get copper sulfate. I will get water, but I will also get carbon dioxide. So this way it's easier for me to identify when the reaction is completed because bubbles will start, will stop coming. Now, once I have the aqua salt, I can filter it. Why? Because if I filter the solid part will be separated from the aqueous part and then I will crystallize the salt. So filter, then crystallize the filtrate. Why is it important to filter first? Because we need to make sure that any solid that was there, which did not react, wo alehda ho jai. Okay. So again, we keep going back to the same ideas that one is to know what salt you need to make and how you make that. And second is to know how you will extract that. So if you do not, you totally disregard the extraction method, your method will fail because the fourth method that we had for making salts was with ammonia. So you can take an ammonia, ammonia gas and react it with any acid to get that salt. So if I need ammonium chloride, I will react it with HCl. If I need ammonium sulfate, I will react it with sulfuric acid. If I need ammonium carbonate, I'll react it with carbonic acid. So it all depends on what acid you reacted with that you get the salt out. Okay. So that is the method of making salts and then extracting salts. Now, a few terms that you should always put in your answer. So for example, if your answer involves making soluble salt, then it's always a good idea to filter to make sure any extra things are separated. And then if you need to make crystal, then the method of crystallization. So how do you crystallize things? So the method is you heat to saturation point. And then slowly cool. Okay. Similarly, if you needed to, let's suppose get the insoluble salt out, then you take the residue. So you take the residue 
you filter obviously to get that and then with the residue you're going to uh dry in folds of filter paper So how do you make insoluble salt? And that's your last method. You take two ions that you're going to use to make salt and they will come from different soluble salts. So let's suppose I want to make one salt and obviously that salt has ion A and B. So I will need some salt that has A and some salt that has B but they should both dissolve in water. Why do I need them to dissolve in water? Because if they're not soluble, ions will not be free to move around and react. So I need them to be free. I need them to react. But after they have reacted, I need them to bond together to make this new salt and be insoluble. So this salt is insoluble. So how does that work? You take one salt that is soluble in water. You dissolve it to another salt of your choice that is also soluble in water. Now they will exchange their partners, the ions that you have in there. So this is called double displacement because of that, that you exchange their partners and you are going to get two salts, one of them solid, one of them soluble. So this method is the best if you want to make so salt that is insoluble. So let's suppose I want to make silver chloride. Then I need one salt that has silver in it and that should be soluble. So can you tell me one silver salt that is soluble? So if you are in doubt, choose from snap. So sodium nitrate, ammonium, potassium. So you can simply be like, okay, yeah, silver nitrate. Very good. And then give me one salt that has chloride in it, but it is soluble. So again, you can choose from snap. So you can sodium chloride, potassium chloride, ammonium chloride. Now, they're going to replace their partner. So they're going to exchange it. So silver is going to react with chloride and potassium is going to react with nitrate. Now this is aqueous because it's snap. This is snap. This is also snap, but this one is halide and it's insoluble for solid, uh, for silver. So there you go. You now have solid salt. That is a precipitate. You will see white powder coming out this white powder you can filter and then because it's solid you can extract the residue and when you take the residue you dry it in folds of filter paper you can easily extract this okay so that's the main concept 